Hello my friends, this is Lindy. Welcome to Lindy's Magpie Reads and another Friday Reads edition. So before I say anything else, I want to state my intention of saying all of the pertinent information out loud, the titles, the authors, illustrators, translators, because uh, I forgot to say a couple of titles in my last Friday Reads. And yes, I can show the book, but for those of you who listen, like me, normally when I'm watching BookTube, I'm actually listening. I'm not watching very much. I, I mostly um, treat BookTube like podcasts. There are a few exceptions. Some people who do really remarkable things with your videos like Martha from Self Righteousness and Scott and Nell from Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. Those I know I want to sit down in front of a screen and be watching. Otherwise I'm mostly listening and it's very irritating when I don't catch the title of something. What book are they talking about? That sounds really good. So I am going to make an effort to say the titles. Let's see how well I do. Another good reason for saying it all out loud is I know I have at least one subscriber who's blind. So <laughs> hello, Mason. All right. What did I do in the past week? We did make a trip out of town. I think I'll put in a little clip of our tiny puppy playing with a couple of big dogs. We uh, went uh, about an hour and a half northwest of Edmonton where I live into a rural area so you can see a little bit of what my surroundings are like. And uh, we had fun with the outdoor gathering, cooked food over a campfire. It was great. And I think I will throw a few pictures of my garden at the end if you want to stick around for that. We, weather-wise, we have had snow and temperatures up to 18 degrees in the last week. So <laughs> that's typical spring. As far as books go, I have finished eight books in the last week and I have abandoned two. Uh, six of those books were by Canadians, four were by queer authors, two feature main characters from the Middle East, uh, Yemen and Afghanistan. Uh, there were two audiobooks, two books about art, two about quality of life in old age. There was a graphic novel, there's a picture book, and uh, what's the last one? A poetry collection. So, the two that I didn't finish, uh, one was, I guess you could call it a buddy read, Sean the Book Maniac was reading it out loud to me over Voxer, a collection of short stories by Joe Okonkwo. It's called Kiss the Scars on the Back of My Neck. And we got about halfway through. What I liked, sorry Frida, what I like about the way he writes is there's an emotional turn right at the very end of every story. What I didn't like is there's a lot of just okay in the process of getting to that point. So competent stories, but they didn't wow me and even less so for Sean. So we're on to bigger and better things now. And the other one I didn't finish was also an audiobook, a professional narrator for that one. Spy uh, thriller by Mick Herron called Slow Horses, and the series is uh, Slough House. I got three and a half hours in, and I realized that I felt no emotional connection with the characters who are bitter men and women who are in the Secret Service in the UK and they've made mistakes and now they want to get back to active service instead of more uh, spinning their wheels type work. And I got far enough into it to see what the main plot is for that one but I wasn't intellectually interested either, and I also didn't care what happened. 
so all signs that it's just not a book for me. <laughs> Frida really wants to get into the shot here. You finished? Come on. So as usual, I am going to save the best book for the end. And as usual, the rest of the books are pretty darn good too. So starting with a collection of short stories by Asian Canadian author Kim Fu. Uh, she's queer too. Lives in Seattle now as far as I know. This collection is called Lesser Known Monsters of the 21st Century. Now, there's 12 stories in here. All of them, except one, have a sort of um, surreal quality, like a touch of science fiction or um, horror or the fantastical in some way or another. But the monsters are more about modern mutations, um, the gyro of garbage in the ocean becomes a sort of monster, social media, uh, technology is really a feature in um, some of these stories like um, a device that can make time speed up forwards and backwards, and another one that um, allows the reconstitution of a dead body. I think my favorites in here had to do with uh, a teenage girl, so coming of age story, but what was happening to her was she was growing wings on her ankles, and that was very tenderly done. Um, and the other one, a June bugs, it's kind of nightmarish infestation of beetles. Uh, the one that I thought didn't have that surreal quality is one about, that's the one that is overtly queer, a lesbian erotic story, maybe psychological horror in that one. Um, but the, all of these stories are very tightly written. They're so nice, crisp, if you're looking for something a little bit strange, a bit of a frisson, uh, I do recommend this. So, another Canadian author, Emily St. John Mandel, who lives in the U.S., like Kim Fu. Emily is in New York City. And her latest book, Sea of Tranquility, has a, a really wide time span. It starts out in 1912 and by the end of it we're into the 25th century with people living on the moon, colonies on the moon, maybe in the Sea of Tranquility. I listened to the audiobook first and it's got a, a great cast of four narrators for the four different voices in the, in the novel. Really experienced audiobook narrators, John Lee, Arthur Morey, Dylan Moore, and Kirsten Potter, who I've heard do other audiobooks, many other audiobooks. Yeah, fine, fine job. So this is a time travel story, and we do go back and forth in time. The author does a great job of maintaining the narrative flow, keeping a forward momentum, and I never had trouble keeping track, uh, but all of the pieces come together into a nice neat puzzle at the end, still leaving room for wondering and the question, what is reality? So good. Yeah, actually that question about reality made me think about the movie The Matrix, which I had never seen, but I knew enough about it to know that that's a big theme in it. And I ended up watching it this week. I really liked it. So cross that off my list. 
there's a section of this book about an author who's doing a book tour for a novel that she wrote a couple novels back, so not her most recent one, but that novel called Marion Bad is being made into a movie. And it's a novel about a pandemic. So it's so obviously auto fiction, you know, with Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven. And I actually really liked that part, the idea that in the 23rd century, there's still author tours going on. Somebody who lives on the moon is on Earth doing an author tour. Uh, but also, she has lots of examples of the strange and sometimes insulting things that people say to authors in the question period or in the signing line that just sound like they're drawn from the, the author's own experience. Uh, the fact that the her book in the novel is called Marian Bad made me want to read uh, or watch another movie. What's it called? Last Year at Marian Bad, which I also haven't seen. So if you know that movie, let me know. Should I read it? Should I watch it? <laughs> I keep saying read because I hardly ever watch things. Ah, anyway, there is a sort of cameo appearance of a few characters from a different book uh, that Emily St. John Mandel wrote, particularly Morella and Vincent. So I was really happy to see them. So loved it. I had just finished listening to the audiobook when the print book came in for me at the library. So I spent some time skimming through this and reliving the pleasure of the story. I highly recommend this one. Uh, another audiobook that I listened to is called Paradise um, and it's actually a radio play. The playwright is Laura Maria Sensabella. It's uh, just a short like two-hour audiobook and a lot of that is interview with the playwright at the end. It's a really excellent production because there's a Foley artist doing all sound effects, there's um, music between scenes, and it is set in a high school. There is a Yemeni uh, high school, I think, she, I think she's in grade 12, and her science teacher and the inter interactions between them. It does explore the whole issue of women progressing into higher education science. And another book, this one is set in the Middle East. The um, author is from Afghanistan, Baram Rahman, and uh, he now lives in Canada. And the illustrator Peggy Collins is also Canadian. A sky blue bench. So this is partly based on the author's own experiences of going to school in Kabul in the 1990s and the central character Arya has a prosthesis, an artificial leg. She has trouble at school once she's well enough to go back to school because they have no furniture. All of the furniture from their school was burned. To, It's explained in the story to keep warm in the author's afterward, which is excellent, by the way. I cried reading the afterward. Uh, the, the author said that internally displaced people uh, were living in the school that he went to, and they burned the firewood for warmth. What Aria ends up doing is um, gathering up scrap material and getting help to build a bench so that she can be comfortable at school. And the illustrations are um, kind of cartoon-like and very joyous.
you look closely, her little brother is reading a book called The Library Bus, which was Rahman's first picture book. And you can see here where her leg is missing under the cover, and there's the leg. And she's not sad for long because she gets the idea of building a bench. In this scene and in the text, we see there's there are children selling bubble gum and paper pinwheels in the market. So not all children are going to school. There they're building the bench with the help of her mother. So the author says, when he was in first grade, I attended a special presentation that taught us how to distinguish between landmines and toys. One type of landmine they showed us was brightly colored and looked like a butterfly. It was even called a butterfly mine. Its design has a reputation for being particularly attractive to curious children. Uh, Afghanistan is a country that has many um, unexploded ordnance, which is also explained at the back. Now the this book had me going down a rabbit hole of girls schooling in Afghanistan and I know that with the Taliban last year many girls are not going to school at all um, but there's an excellent documentary called What Tomorrow Brings that Rahman recommends. I also watched Afghanistan School for Girls, which is uh, on the 101 East Al Jazeera program. In that one, I learned about a school at the edge of Kabul where there are 7,000 girls and many more boys. There's seven or eight school buildings, all used by the boys. The girls have their classes outdoors, and they have their classes in three shifts, um, three four-hour shifts, starting at six in the morning. There are only something like 52 teachers for all of these girls. And there were two new school buildings that were built by um, donations from foreigners, I think from Japan, so that the, the girls would have a school um, building to protect them from sun and rain. And the local leaders, the, who were men, decided that the boys would use them. And the boys are crowded too. Uh, there are scenes inside the boys' school buildings where they're in having classes in stairwells and hallways and everywhere. There's just not enough school space, but you know, the girls don't even get indoor space, maybe tents. That's that's it. Yeah. Breaks your heart. And speaking of heartbreaking, there's this graphic memoir, Dying for Attention. The subtitle is a graphic memoir of nursing home care. It's by Susan McLeod, whose mother, when she was in her 80s, needed to go into uh, full-time care. And it's that whole journey of the many failings of elder care in Canada, and also about family relationships Susan had a difficult relationship with her mother, which really improved, actually, um, during the period that she's talking about. Uh, she also had a difficult relationship with her little brother, and that didn't really improve. So there's a lot about families in here as well. If you are interested in more on this subject, I've read another couple of books recently not in graphic format, but uh, Neglected No More by Andre Picard and Happily Ever After by Maura Welsh. 
both are excellent. I'll put the details in the um, in the notes down below. To give you an idea of her style, a simple fine line gets the idea across. There's lots of humorous parts in here. <laughs> if you don't laugh, you'd cry, so. <laughs> Another one day at the heart. So this one is by a local poet, a non-binary author. They're a co-owner of a local bookstore, Glass Bookshop. Their name is Jason Purcell. And their first full-length collection of poetry is called Swollening. This book is divided into three sections. And the first part is about um, the narrator's youth and kind of swallowing um, or internalizing homophobia, basically. The second section is all about illness, physical illness and lots of dental stuff, and also illness as a metaphor, the way that living in this society makes us ill. And the third section, my favorite, is all about healing, uh, gaining wisdom through age, until we get to the final poem, which is totally heartwarming um, about being in a garden surrounded by the loving support of queer friends. So I do recommend Swollening by Jason Purcell. Next up, this is an art book can't call it a coffee table book because of its size, but basically it's just pictures of art. It's called Library, and the two artists, they work collaboratively, are Michael Dumontier and Neil Farber, and they both live in Winnipeg. So the art pieces are reproduced life-size in this book um, that came out from Drawn and Quarterly. And they're all basically um, paintings of books with various sort of strange or pithy sayings on them. So sometimes one book will take up a whole page, sometimes there'll be four, and sometimes more than that. Let me see more. The Kill Me Once, Shame on You. Reminded me of one of the stories in Lesser Known Monsters of the 21st Century because in that one there's um, sort of a toy that's a glass cube and um, you can watch a plant grow from seed in it and then the leaves get bigger and bigger and bigger until it f they fill the whole cube and then it keeps growing until it's just a dead plant inside. And then you can reverse it, almost like watching a film, I guess. But it's entirely three-dimensional. So that was library. And the last book I'm going to tell you about, my favorite. Look at all my little flags, passages I loved. Spring Cannot Be Cancelled. David Hockney in Normandy by... Martin Gayford. Uh, these two men collaborated on a book about art. Uh, I think it was called A History of Art. Yeah, something like that. I'll put the details down below. That's an all ages book. This one, this one is for adults. Uh, it's beautifully designed with so many illustrations in it. Not only of David Hockney's work, but also when his work is compared to the work of someone else's, like in this case, Vincent van Gogh. Um, you don't have to look it up on the internet. There's, it's reproduced right here on this really um, thick matte paper. 
It was in 2019 that David Hockney purchased a piece of uh, property in Normandy, a rural property, because he wanted to paint the flowers. There was an orchard there with apple trees, plum trees, cherry trees, and he wanted to paint flowers. So when the pandemic came along, Hockney was already happily ensconced and he said it worked out well for him because he had no visitors coming to bother him and he could just paint and paint and paint. Well, he draws also. So many of his works of art now are done on an iPad and he just does amazing work on the iPad. And then they get printed in large format. So if you can see, this is Hockney, the size of, there, there's, there he is. And these are printouts from his iPad. Look how huge they are, landscapes. He says, uh, a larger scale makes a difference, but so does a shift in texture or in context, and of course, position in a sequence. Thus, a hundred landscapes in a row would have a different effect from one alone, because each one would add to what had already been seen. So what he had to say about looking at a series of pictures in a row really had me thinking again about library because my initial reaction to this book was hmm, I, it's okay it's intriguing but I wasn't really getting the point of it um, but then I've gone back to it and flipped through it again and again and that's interesting how um, context can help you make sense of things. I love looking at art. I love reading about art. So <laughs> this was really up my alley. Hockney just has so many interesting things to say about really looking, really seeing, um, and how to live your life. Um, he is He's in his 80s now. He knows that he doesn't have a lot of time left on this earth and he wants to make the most of it. Here's a section where Gayford, who did a lot of FaceTiming with Hockney, so there's a lot of direct quotes from Hockney in here, but um, this one isn't a direct quote because he's talking about how the experience of really, really looking at something like a painting, Hockney argues that doing so helps to relieve anxiety. What is stress, he asks. It's worrying about something in the future. Art is now. He also talks about how photography doesn't capture the way that we see. So for example, if you look at a field of wildflowers, you're gonna see all the different little colors. But if you take a photograph of it, it's mostly the green that's going to show up. So our eyes interpret things differently than a camera does. And that's something that really intrigues Hockney. Also looking at a sunset, a photograph just captures one instant of it, but a sunset is something that elapses. So he made some animations. You can see a little bit of it here. Some stills from the animation. The final panel reads, remember you cannot look at the sun or death for very long. <laughs> Hockney says, Long before they put their death awaits you warnings on cigarette packets, there were all these buildings that reminded us that death was coming. They were called churches. Hockney again. We have lost touch with nature, rather foolishly, as we are a part of it, not outside it. This will in time be over, and then what? What have we learned? I'm almost 83 years old. I will die. The cause of death is birth. 
The only real things in life are food and love in that order. I really believe this, and the source of art is love. I love life. This was just so inspiring. Spring cannot be canceled. And I want to mention that Hockney's art is used on the cover of the UK editions of Ali Smith's Quartet and also her latest one companion piece. And my dear friend Kathy got this for me as a gift. She just gave it to me yesterday. So I'm really looking forward to reading another Ali Smith. And she also brought me Salt Lick by Lulu Allison. Not available in Canada, so thanks. Oh, I have these other books on the go right now and I just want to stop those and start reading these. So many good things. Right. Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching and hang in there if you want to see a few pictures from my garden and please talk to me in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Bye for now.